Welcome back to the fifth session of the Foundations of Machine Learning Programming Lab. Today, uh, we will talk about tree-based classifiers. As you might have learned from the lecture, there are two main algorithms to calculate tree-based classifiers. One is ID3, which is for nominal data, and the CART algorithm is the second one uh, for numerical data. In this notebook, we are going to implement and compare both of them on the same data uh, to see which one might perform better than the other. Um, let's see one slight deviation from our previous setups, which only imported NumPy. Uh, today, we're also going to use counter. Don't worry, collections is part of the built-in Python uh, library. So um, what counter does is it transforms a list of values into a dictionary of values and counts. So this list right here, A, B, A, there are two A's and one B in this list. And this is exactly what counter constructs for us. It's just a very handy shorthand, uh, so we don't have to actually implement this logic ourselves. Um, and we're going to use this quite a lot in today's, uh, in today's exercise. As every time uh, we start out with the data, and for this notebook, we are going to use the very famous Iris toy data set. Uh, it contains three classes, and each class corresponds to a different kind of Iris plant, which is a flower. And each of these plants is described by four features, um, which mainly relate to the size of the uh, flower head. For each of the three classes, we have 50 instances, so 150 samples in total. And the uh, special thing about this data set and the thing that makes it so common in statistical testing and illustrations is that two of them are linearly separable and the third one is not linearly separable. And so we need a classifier that can construct nonlinear decision boundaries. And spoiler, um, tree-based classifica uh, classification can actually do uh, nonlinearly separable classes. This code is pre-filled. Um, we are just going to load the iOS dataset from sklearn, as we also did in the previous weeks. Um, and then this is pretty much just copied over from last week. We are going to assemble the data set into this D object, which corresponds to the way data is uh, notated in the lecture. So pairs of a feature vector and um, a target class. We're going to randomly shuffle this set and then split into AT20 uh, train and test data. This is where we stopped last week processing our data. This week, we have to go one step further. And that is we want to quantize our data. As I mentioned before, uh, ID3 can only use categorical or nominal data. Um, but if we have a very short look into our data set, uh, let me quickly restart the kernel. Uh, wait. We can see that we have numerical data. And so we need some way of transforming this numerical data into a categorical variable. And the, this process is called quantization or digitization. Um, and the way we're going to do this is we're going to figure out the uh, quantiles of each feature and then using these quant or quartiles of each feature, because we're going to have four of them, and then we are going to represent each value in the feature column by the index of the quartile it belongs to. So this might sound very ominous right now, um, but let me quickly implement this quantize function with you. And I think it will then just become much, much clearer what is meant here. So the first step is to establish what sort of bins we want to place our data into. And we're going to use empire.quantile on an array. And we want to split it into, um, in this case, four, but rather keep the implementation general and depend on this Q parameter. So we're going to construct a linear space, which just divides the, so this is like the Python range thing, but you can specify special stuff. For example, I want to start at zero, end at one, and I want to have q plus one um, 
values. The first one will be the zero, the last one will be the one. Uh, so I'm going to restrict this to the second to second to last because we don't want the zero and the one in there. And these are sort of the boundaries of the bins that we place our data into. And we can just very quickly uh, print these bins and use um, just toy data, so we quantize uh, some random data, uh, let's do 100. You can see that um, these 100 values, if you place them into quartiles, and this is not unexpected because they are um, evenly sampled from the 0, 1 range, that our first uh, quarter is from 0 to 0.27, so 0.25 in an ideal setting, the second is from 0.27 to 0 0.53, 0 0.5 in an ideal setting, and then uh, 7.5 respectively, 7.9 in this case, um, for the last bin. And so each number that would fall in this first uh, interval between 0 and 0 0.27, would be represented by zero. Everything that falls between this value and this value will be represented by one. Everything that will lie between this value and this value will be represented by a two. And everything between this and the last one will be represented by um, a four. Or a, no, a three. So we only have four quantiles. So what we're going to do now is apply um, mp.digitize, and we can actually do that right in the return statement. What digitize does is uh, it takes our data and it takes a list of, of boundaries between uh, or these buckets down here and places everything inside these buckets. So exactly what I explained before, that everything between zero and this falls into the first bucket. So we can just do array in bins and once again, have a look what the output is. Since it's not the last line, we have to actually print it. And we can see that our data is represented by the respective bins. So note that all of these numbers are random, so uh, these bins don't make any sense right now, um, but just so you get the general idea. The last thing is that I now have four discrete values to represent my numerical data. And this is actually data that uh, ID3 can then later deal with. So the step for us is to actually apply this quantization to our training data. And uh, we can do that um, basically by copying this over. Um, but doing things a little bit different here. Um, actually, we can just use the, uh, I'm going to use a list comprehension. Uh, so for every document in D, uh, document for document in D, and we want to apply the quantization. Um, mm, give me a sec. Okay, let me rephrase that. We're going to actually copy this over because it makes the list comprehension would be much more complex than the solution right here. Um, so what I'm going to do here is instead of taking this data directly, we're going to do numpy apply along axis. And the function we want to apply is quantize. The axis that we want to apply it along is data. And we can also pull this statement out of here to show it. Uh, so what this does, it takes every column in our data um, and it applies the function along this column. And the reason this is important is that we need the whole column to correctly determine uh, these bins. We need to calculate the quantiles of each feature. And since each feature is a complete column, we also need the uh, values in one long series for each column. And the axis argument here uh, specifies that we want to apply it along this axis so it gets separately applied to each of the four columns. And this yields the correctly quantized data. The same thing uh, we're going to do on 
this down here. Uh, mm -hmm. And we also need to shuffle this, so we might actually be better off by doing the quant right here. And then saying, uh, then uh, shuffling this, we can once again copy this over. This is exactly the same routine as up there, um, just in a quantized manner. So the quantized and uh, let's do this and this whole thing once again for the test set. Um, let's shift the indices around. And now we also have shuffled test data. So let's quickly check this. Quantized, this looks correct. We actually have quantized data. Sorry. Okay, the uh, next thing we are going to need is to uh, implement some notion of entropy. And this is because for both ID3 and the card algorithm, we will use entropy as the splitting criterion to determine which feature we're going to use at each node to split the data into two or more different subsets. And um, we're going to just use the entropy formula from, um, from the lecture. So this is basically the Shannon entropy, which is the probability of a class uh, times the log two of this probability. So H is commonly the symbol for entropy. Then the next thing is to n samples. Uh, which is our number of samples. We need this to calculate the probabilities. This is just the length of the data set we give into this function. Um, we're going to then count the class occurrences. So for each class, how often does it occur in our data? And this is where our counter uh, helper class comes in. And uh, since our data, let me quickly pull this up or comparison, um, our data look like this, and we only want this first part, so we can just unpack it in a list comprehension. We can do C for nothing. So this is a common Python shorthand to denote variables that are that have to be there for syntactic reasons, um, but we are never going to use it. So this is sort of an unnamed uh, temporary variable. And so what this does, it just gives us the second value for every tuple in D. So only these values up here. And then we're going to apply the counter, which gives us a dictionary of um, values and counts, so 0, 2, 3, and then how often they occur in the data. OK, um, these class counts, of course, need to be normalized by the samples to get the class probabilities. Uh, so we're going to do class counts equals key value divided by n samples or key value in class counts.items. So this is a dictionary comprehension. It works the same as a list comprehension, just with uh, curly brackets and key values instead of just the value. And what this does, it divides the count of each class by the total number, so we get the estimated probability. And then we can uh, basically sum this up over all of the different classes. So minus the sum of class counts k, and this times the log two of class counts k. So this is the class probability times the log two, wait, log two of the class counts. Um, don't forget this two right there. Uh, for k in class counts dot keys. Actually, you know what? We can simplify this. Uh, we can do key value and then just replace this with value. Much simpler. And then this comprehension all gets summed up, and we need to take the negative since these logs uh, will turn everything negative. Okay, 
And this is our entropy function. We can now, for any given set of data, calculate its entropy. With, the, with this out of the way, uh, we can start implementing the ID3 algorithm. And similar to the lecture, we're going to implement it in two different steps. The first step is to implement the function that calculates the information gain for ID3, so the splitting criterion. And then in the second step, um, we're going to actually implement the training function. So first up is the information gain. As you might recall from the lecture, the information gain for ID3 is uh, the entropy of the total entropy of the whole data set. And then uh, we're going to calculate the entropy separately for each feature and determine uh, or for each expression of a feature. Um, and then we're going to uh, compare which feature in the complete data set has the maximum information gain. So the first step is to compute the total entropy. So HT equals the entropy of the whole data set. And then we need to uh, once again count our different feature occurrences. So counter, and here we're going to do D zero, which I'll do this in a list. D zero, and then the feature we are currently looking at. So this will give us the feature vector. And since feature is just the index of the feature we currently want to calculate the information gain for, we can once again sub-index it um, for every document in D. And based on these counters, we can then uh, calculate the total uh, entropy for this feature. So for f in f dot keys, so for every single value our feature can take, for every single categorical or nominal value, um, since this is what we calculated up here. Um, and once again, we also not only need the key, but also the values. So uh, not keys, but items, sorry. Um, our entropy is the total sum, so we can just use this continuous sum operator to increase the zero right here. And this will be equal to uh, the value we saved up here, normalized uh, by our data set. So this is the conditional probability of this expression of the feature times minus the entropy minus the entropy. And here we're going to filter um, because we only want to look at the samples in the data set where our feature actually has that value. And uh, we could do the list comprehension. Um, I normally don't like to use list comprehensions here because I find it awkward to write if else statements in list comprehensions. I rather use this filter syntax. It's really similar. Uh, you just write a short lambda function that tells you if something should be included or not. So if x0 feature equals uh, our specified value up here, then we want to include it. And if not, not. And what filter does, it, it applies this function to every single element in the iterable we give it, in this case d. Um, if this evaluates to true, it is kept in the result. If not, it's just discarded. Um, also, filter is a generator, so we need to cast it back into a list before we can actually do something with the data. And then the information gain is just, or the, the delta entropy, um, or entropy delta, other way around, is just uh, the total entropy minus this uh, accumulated feature entropy. Okay, we have something to split our data on. So now we have to think about how can we actually construct a tree with that. And um, this creates a problem for us that we have to come up with a data structure that allows us to specify such a tree. And since we don't want to rely on any external packages or don't want to do object-oriented programming, um, I chose to just represent everything as nested dictionaries. This is neither the fastest nor the most efficient or the most easy to work with approach, um, but I guess it really gets the point across without you needing to think yourself into a tree uh, library in Python. 
Um, so each node in our tree is a dictionary. And this dictionary has a label, so the, the class that is for this uh, node. Then the feature, which specifies which feature this node uses as splitting criterion. And then it has a dictionary of children. And this dictionary will just contain um, keys in the form of the different values this feature can take. And then the values of the dictionary are the subnodes. Um, this might sound confusing right now, but I swear it will become uh, clearer in a second when we actually implement it. We're going to orient ourselves in the algorithm in the lecture. So you can open the lecture slides in a separate window to compare what I'm doing here to what is written down there. Um, and the lecture starts out with computing the counts of all the different classes. Um, so once again, we're going to use this counter thing. Uh, C for nothing, comma C in documents. So this is the same we did up here, um, or the, the cell above. And then the lecture specifies two early exit criterions. The first one, or actually, first the lecture specifies that we should assign the label to the most frequent class. So class counts. This is a very short and nifty way of calculating the maximum, the key with the maximum value in a dictionary. You can do this in different ways. Um, so max takes this optional key argument, which holds a value from a dictionary and then uses that to calculate a max. Um, so you can just specify this get function. Um, once again, this is just a very short and concise way to write it. You can implement it differently, no problem. Um, so the first exit criterion uh, the lecture specifies if our class counts uh, one, um, or rather the length of it. So if we only have one class, if D is pure, uh, we can just stop because there's nothing else to, uh, to classify here. We're just going to return T as is. And also note that this means that all our terminal nodes have feature none and empty children and just the label sent to the class that we want to assign if we reach this terminal node. Also, we get a feature list uh, up here. And if that is empty, we also can't do any further classification. So if features uh, or if not features, so features are empty, we also just want to return T. And with that out of the way, we can actually uh, construct a complete or proper node for our tree. Um, so we need to find our splitting criterion. We need to find the feature with the maximum uh, information gain um, in order to split on that. What we're going to do is find this by calling np.argmax, which gives us the index of the maximum value of an array. And in here, we're going to use list map. Um, you can do this in a for loop interpended. I like to use maps just because it's written in a more concise way. Um, and what map, it's basically the same as filter, um, but instead of filtering everything out that does not have this function, just applies this function and returns the result. So we want to map a function to an iterable, in this case, our features. And for each entry in features, so for each of our features, we want to calculate the information gain uh, for ID3 using the document set and that feature. And what this expression gives us is just a, a list of, uh, of the different information gains of each, each feature. And the argmax then gives us the index of the maximum uh, information gain. So the index of our maximum class. So then we can set the feature of our node, so the splitting criterion to that feature by using uh, this index. Okay, um, since we don't want to hand this feature to all subtrees, it's now removed from the set, we also need to actually remove it. I'll say features.remove 
um, t feature. This does not return anything, it just modifies features in place. And then uh, following along the lecture slides or the lecture algorithm, we want to calculate the domain of our maximum feature. This just means the different values that our feature can take. Um, so the domain A, uh, A is because the notation in lecture specifies it as A, which is referring to it as an event, um, which comes from the whole entropy uh, side of formulating this. Um, so our domain is of course a set. Um, we can do a little comprehension here and cast it to a set. So this is valid. We can also just use curly brackets directly and have a set comprehension. Um, so we're going to do d0, which gives us the feature vector of each sample in, uh, in our document set. And then we look at just the current feature or the feature we previously identified as the optimal one for splitting. We do that for every document and this gives us just a set of the different values our feature can take. And so for every value in that set, uh, DOM A, we want to first build a subset um, of data and for subsets we once again will use this list filter uh, syntax. So we want to filter only these where the feature Right, t feature uh, is equal to the one we currently are looking at. So t feature uh, equals a. And we want to filter everything from the document set. And then we're going to check if actually any data is left over, because if we are perf we perfectly split here, uh, we don't need to do any recursive calls, but if we actually have data left that we can do more splits on, um, then we're going to do a recursive call and the children uh, of this node, so once again, the key will be the feature expression, so an element of the domain, and then the value is the uh, recursive call. Now with the reduced data set, um, where we only supply the data um, that is our feature here. And of course, our reduced feature set, because we don't want to look at this feature again. And this is the whole ID3 algorithm implemented. Um, so the things that I think are the most confusing here is representing a tree with dictionaries. Once again, there are more elegant ways to doing this, but this suffices for uh, the task at hand and then understanding how this uh, recursion works. And I invite you to take one more look at the lecture slides to uh, basically go through each line here and see which parts of the mathematical formulation of this algorithm um, it corresponds to. Um, and I think that gives you a much clearer picture of uh, why uh, we do this uh, recursion. We basically extract the data that is not yet perfectly classified and then apply ID3 again to get a subtree and then we just build it recursively from there. Okay, um, we can try it out and I hope that I didn't make an error in any of the two functions before. We're going to, we have to execute this of course um, and then we can try again and it seems like this has worked. So let's take a short look at ID3 model, which is just a dictionary, right? This T is always just a dictionary, it gets returned. So this is our whole tree. And you can see uh, the first node uh, as the first class as a label, it splits at the first feature and it has uh, a couple of children. So one children at key zero, which once again uh, is in such a node and just stacks all the way down until we find a terminal node over here if we reach this, we will just assign uh, label zero and we see feature none, so we don't actually need to go deeper. Um, however, since this is just a dictionary, um, we cannot yet use it to predict anything for our data. We need a function that knows about the special structure of this dictionary to traverse it for us. So given a new data point, go through all of this data and figure out which of these terminal nodes we will end up at. 
Um, the second thing I want you to observe here is how very simple uh, these decision worlds are, right? Um, and this is really the, the nice thing about tree-based classification, that the tree-based classifiers you get out of it are, in most cases, not that complex, and they are very explainable. So if we see that, for example, this, uh, right, this feature right here encodes the width of the flower, um, then I can tell you exactly at which value which decision or my classifier does. And this really sets apart tree-based classification from approaches like neural networks, um, which are essentially black box learning. But here, the decision the uh, algorithm does is very, very transparent. And that's a nice feature to have. OK, back to implementing stuff. Uh, we want to implement a function that traverses this tree, given new data, and see at which term on the node our new data ends up at, which then coincides with the class we want to assign to this um, this data sample. So we need to implement this predict function. There are two hints here. Um, the implementation should, of course, be recursive. Whenever you encounter tree data in computer science, it's always a good idea to look into recursive solutions because iterative solutions just tend to not work. Um, and then the second hint is that we can identify our leaf nodes by checking if the feature is now. And as you might remember from our introductions to algorithms and data structures, if you do recursion, you always need a recursive call, and also you need the base case. And in our case, this base case is just if feature is none. Then we have reached the end of our recursion stack. So if feature is none, we can just return whatever is the current class uh, of the model. Of course, feature is not a variable. Um, we actually have to get this from our model, from the tree. So if model feature, and again, model is just a dictionary. It can be this whole dictionary nested. It can just be this last, very last one here. And we can check whatever is in the feature key. And if this is none, then we just want to return whatever is saved in the label. So, for example, if we reach uh, this node over here for some reason, we can see, okay, features none, it's terminal, we will just return this one over here. However, if feature is not none, we know that we are at an intermediate node in our, um, in our tree, and we need to recursively traverse. Um, and that means that in the other case, we will just return whatever predict uh, ID3 returns for um, the children. The question is which children we will choose. Um, and this uh, just depends on whatever our input data specifies. For example, in the first node over here, we have feature one, and this can take the values 0, 1, 2, or 3. And we can have a look at our input data um, at the current features. So this is the feature vector. We look at the index of our feature and see what value is there and use that to find the children dictionary, which is now again a, th a tree, which we can supply to this predict function. And uh, of course, we want to do it with the same uh, input data. Let's get rid of this default code here. And this just gives us a way to predict stuff using our model. Let's shortly test it. Uh, predict ID3. And we will wait currently tickets. Um, we will use the, uh, what did I call it? ID3 model from before. And um, let's just do one, two, three. Oh, we have into the bar. Ah, yeah. So this should be model of feature. Actually, let's simplify it and do feature equals, which will make it much more readable because we don't have these infinitely nested brackets down here, but just a more concise version. And we can see that for the input one, two, three, our tree predicts that this would be class two. Um, wait, I did not want to show you that already. Um, 
let's now have a look at what happens on the larger scale. Um, what happens if we evaluate our model? What we want to do is uh, uh, metrics import classification report. As in the weeks before, we will just use this handy classification report um, to calculate different metrics about our model. Um, of course, we will have to apply the predict functions. So we can just do a list comprehension, um, predict ID3, ID3 model, and D for D in D test quantized. Um, let's shortly run this. We have error. Ah, okay. Um, I think I know what the error is, and that is it complains about an unhashable type, um, which always happens if you try to access a dictionary using NumPy array as a feature. Um, and this happens. In the recursive call, I'm not quite sure why. Let me quickly read into the code to figure out what's going wrong here. So D feature. Ah, yeah. Um, I'm calling this using the tuple that's in D test count, but that's not actually what I want to put in here. I want to put in just the feature vector, so D0. And we can see that uh, this is now just the predicted classes for all our test data. Of course, we can compare this uh, using the classification report, which takes, I think, the true data first. It doesn't really matter um, in which order you put it in there, but I think it takes Y true first. And to get the nice formatting, we will actually have to print it. Ah, and of course, not data target, but uh, D1 or D in D test quant. Sorry for that. So I supplied the whole data set, which is of length 150, but we only do the test set for the prediction. So we have a mismatch between the two. Um, and this will fix it. And we can see that uh, our tree classifier is actually very bad. Um, so 0.57 seems okay, but if you recall that we only have three classes which are perfectly balanced, um, we can determine that a random classifier would ac achieve a QC of 0.33. Um, which is rather high. So 0.57, it learns something, um, but of course it's also just a very, very small and simple model. The question is then, uh, can we improve on this? And how can we improve on this? We can exploit our training data much, much more. Because what we did up here is quantize our data into this format. So ID3 can actually calculate things based on it. But this got rid of a lot of more nuanced data that our model might be attentive to. Um, so using CART, we can actually do computations on the raw data, which looks like this, and this has much more information. The second thing that CART can do, uh, it can... So wait, let me circle back. What ID3 does um, is it splits for every feature exactly once. If you split at a feature, the same feature will not occur in the subtree again. It can occur in the whole classifier tree, but it will not occur in the subtree again. For CART, I can have the same feature later down the road. And this gives CART uh, much more flexibility because CART can figure out its own splitting threshold. So what we did up here for data quantization, we just split beforehand at the borders um, of each quantile. But this is, might be a suboptimal split, um, because if I only look at the subset of a certain flower width, then the flower um, length might be much more meaningful um, if I split it at a different point and not the quantum. So this is something that CART will figure out on its own. 
And for it to do this, we need to implement a slightly different uh, information gain function and then adapt our training function to use that extra knowledge. So what card does, it finds a threshold um, at which to split the numerical data into exactly two classes. And then the tree is built based on that by using uh, binary decision boundaries. So identify the threshold, split it into two, and then recursively apply to both of these two subtrees. So the information gain function um, now returns two values. It returns the maximum entropy, but also returns the threshold that card found optimal here. And this is what we have to implement now. We start off the same uh, by just calculating the entropy of the whole data set that we give to the function. Um, but now we have to compute the splittings. Um, so I'm going to first construct values. If you have a look at the lecture slide, it mentions that CART will split um, or will at least try every single boundary which exists, which is just the midpoint between every two values in the sorted list of values in our training set. So if we have a look at the feature, um, let me build it from the inside out, not from the outside in. So D0 um, feature or D in our document set, this will give us the value of that feature for the current for every document. Um, we don't care about duplicate values since we just want to find the boundaries. So we can just cast it into a set, cast it back to a list to be able to sort it. And if we now sort the set, um, we can just iterate over it and pick every tuple and pick the midway point between both values in this tuple. So splits, which is the set of thresholds that we want to try out is the, the average um, of two values, so values i um, plus values i plus one. So this is the average of two values. And um, we want to do that for every pot, like sliding a window over our list. So we want to do this for everything length values minus one because we don't want to have an index uh, error because we otherwise exceed the maximum length using this plus one. Okay, I will shortly show what is going on here. Um, let me first print D and then print the splits, which will hopefully make it more clear. Uh, Let's just do it on the original data. So information gain part D. Let's do test because it's smaller and zero feature. And what you can see here um, is that this is our data up to this point. And these are our feature vectors. Actually, let's, let's print values. It might be that. Well, these are our values. So these are all the different unique values that the feature can take. This is sort of the domain in the numerical sense. And we pick the midpoint between every single one of these features. So we try to figure out at which point in this area do we have to split the data so that we get two sets. Um, they don't need to be equal in size but we will try every single one of these decision boundaries to figure out which one is the optimal um, to get the highest information gain. So we now will have to find this highest information gain, H max, and the threshold that goes along with this. So we want to find which of these values actually lead to the optimal, uh, uh, optimal entropy. And so we can just iterate over it. We will do it in brute force manner. We split in splits. We will build synthetic data because we have to calculate the entropy for the left and for the right uh, side of that split separately. So we're going to use the, by this point, well-known list uh, filter thing to get everything like zero, 
feature that is on the left side of that split boundary. Um, and the same thing for the right side of that split boundary. So larger than. And we will calculate uh, our entropy. So length of our left set divided by a length of D times the entropy of the left set minus the same thing for the right. So we can just copy this over. Oops. Put this there and replace this with dr. And this will be our total entropy. I think I'm, yeah, I'm missing a bracket here. Of course, uh, if this exceeds what our current maximum is, we want to set hmax to this current value and also set threshold to the one we're currently using, which is this split variable up here. And then at the end, we will just return what's left at the end of this loop, which is the maximum. And we can see that for the test, if we just take the whole set, uh, we have a maximum entropy of zero if we split at the threshold of 7.4. Wait, this is correct? Yes, this is correct. Okay, um, let's do the training loop. This is very similar to uh, the previous ID3 training loop with one notable exception. We replaced this child's dictionary with just left child and right child because we know for card we will only ever have binary partitions. So we can just call them explicitly. And we introduced this threshold parameter because for every node, we have to keep track of where we split our data so that if we want to classify new data or predict something, we can go the same path um, with our new input data. This is exactly the same as uh, before in the uh, ID3 exercise. Um, now we just have to do a different uh, computation to figure out the optimal uh, entropy. So again, we want to compute the optimum split for every feature. So we just call as before information gain cart, uh, cart for that feature for every feature in features. And features here is just 0, 1, 2. Um, before we gave it to it as a parameter, but since cart doesn't actually use that, we reduced it, we just need it once to um, loop over them. Um, so I hard coded them in. Um, then, uh, actually, let's take a look at what's in splits right now. Um, so I can explain the next two lines. Let's call train current. Um, <clears throat> okay, so this is the set for entropy. We can see that for each of the different features, we can actually reach a decision boundary of zero. This is just a property of the data in this case, um, but we have different um, thresholds. And we now want to find the maximum one. What we can do to do that is um, extract the first value of every tuple, so of the different features, oh no, not the features, the different entropy values for each feature into a separate list. So entropy is equals x0 for x in splits, and then we do the same for um, our thresholds. So thresholds equals x1 for x in splits. And then we can do uh, idx max, which is the argmax s with the idx3 algorithm. There's nothing new here to find the optimal entropy. And then set the feature of this node to the 
uh, one this index specifies, so idx max, and the threshold of threshold of this node to the threshold of that index. Okay, um, this is our splitting criterion. Now that we know where to split, we can recursively call on the left and right side of this threshold. So we have to once again compute um, our left and right data set. Again, we, I will use this filter. You can also do it as a list comprehension. I just find it easier to write this way. So for every element, we want to check if the feature, so T feature of this node is for the left side smaller than the threshold. And we will apply this to D. And we can also do dr, which will be the right side, which is larger than the threshold. Note that you don't need to be inclusive here. You don't need to write uh, larger or equal uh, because the thresholds will always be between two different um, two different values. Now that we have dl and dr, we can uh, check and do our recursive calls. So we will first check if our data actually has any data in it. It could be that we eliminate this uh, branch altogether. And so we don't need to recurse here, but if we have data, um, we will return to the left child. And this is just a recursive call to train card on the left split of the data. And similarly, we can do if dr is at least one element large, we can do right, right child equals train card dr. Okay, and this should be it. Um, so again, it's a slightly modified version of ID3. Um, so instead of splitting by all the different feature expressions, we actually fit by two different um, things. You could think about this as moving the quantization that we did before into the algorithm itself. So this is this uh, threshold uh, above below thing is also a method of quantizing data. Now we can see that we now have successfully once again built a tree, but this one looks slightly different because we don't. Uh, we also have these labels, and we have a left and a right chart in this. And as you can see here, recurse is much, much deeper. So this is a more complex tree. And this hopefully means that uh, this tree can build or represent the data to a much finer detail and thus lead to a better outcome in evaluation. Before we can evaluate, though, we once again need uh, a predict function that traverses the tree. Um, this is very, very similar once again uh, to the um, uh, to the predict function we already implemented for ID3. So it will begin in the same way. We do feature equals model feature. So we know what our current node that we are visiting on our traversal um, is splitting at. Once again, our base case for recursion is if feature is none, then we want to return the label of our current node. Oops, there's a new missing feature. If we actually have a feature, um, and this is the part where it differs from the ID3 implementation, we can check if this feature is below the model threshold or not the model, but the, the node threshold uh, that we currently are at. So if the feature of our training or uh, of our um, inference input is smaller than the model threshold, we want to continue our traversal on the right side, uh, on the left side, sorry. So predict card model left child and D and 
in the other case, we want to uh, predict cart okay. model right child, and I'm having a typo there. And the and this return was just boilerplate code. Okay, um, we now have this predict function and I'm quickly going to test if it works. So we're going to just grab any sample or any training vector from our test set and do predict card uh, using our card model and this training input. And this doesn't return anything, that's odd. Ah, I'm returning the wrong thing. Um, so this should be the label, of course. And time for us to evaluate both models and see which one performs best. I will just quickly copy over this code from over here um, because we only need to actually change a few names of the variables. So this should be the test set, non-quantized course this one too. Um, then we have the cart model here and the traversal function for cart. And as we can see, well, we actually got much, much better um, this time around. Why could that be? Um, the main reason why cart performs so much better is that cart has access to a lot more information Right. We don't use all of this fine-grained data detail uh, to quantization. The second and perhaps more important reason is that since CART um, does not discard features that it has already seen. So it, as I noted for ID3, a feature cannot occur in its own subtree. Once I split at a feature, the subtrees of that split cannot take that feature into account anymore. CART can do that. Um, and so it is much, much better at finding um, smaller local uh, combinations of attributes or nonlinear decision boundaries um, in our input data. And this is why we actually chose the iris data set because um, the iris data set is explicitly not linearly separable. So we expect CART to uh, perform much better here. Um, and so in general, if you have numeric data, use CART. If you have just uh, normal ordinary data that is not quantized like proper ordinal data, um, you might as well just use ID3. Um, but yeah, this is why CART performs much better on the numerical version. I hope that uh, you learned a bit about uh, tree-based classification and also how to program trees in Python uh, today. Um, and then see you in the next uh, lecture.